Welcome to the Sloth Investor Podcast with your host, Mr. Sloth. Welcome everyone to episode five of the Sloth Investor Podcast, an investing podcast in which you'll find out why I believe the humble sloth is the best animal to characterize successful investing. And our focus this week is on the fifth bedrock principle of the sloth investor, and that's headstrong. Jay, welcome back again. I'm so happy and delighted to be part of this process and to be here along this journey. Um, and you know what, if anyone who's just tuning in the first time, you it's sort of the, the, the sloth has a double meaning for you in your podcast. The, there's, there's five letters in the word sloth. Can you tell us why you chose the sloth investor as sort of your, your call sign, but, and then the meaning behind sloth? Yeah, Let's that, recap that. Yeah, that's a great, great question, Dre. Seeing as it's the fifth episode and we've come to the final bedrock principle, the fifth bedrock principle, I think it would be useful to kind of have a quick run through those principles and to kind of explain how I was able to devise them as well. So, yeah, so first and foremost, the Sloth Investor is a compound creation of all that I have learned about investing, okay, through reading books, listening to podcasts, watching videos, and so on, through it, many years of investing, okay? And I think there's actually a problem problem in the investing domain, okay? So when we think about investing, commonly the two animals we associate with the realm of investing are the bull and the bear. But I actually believe that we've got things wrong. I actually think it's the sloth. The sloth is the animal that best characterize what we should do, how we should behave as investors. And to circle back to each of the bedrock principles, S-L-O-T-H, those are, you know, there are five bedrock principles that I believe are critical. So for S, we have simplicity, L, low fees, O, owning the world, T, time, and H, this week's focus, headstrong. Okay, so those five bedrock principles are the principles that for me define what it means to be a sloth investor. Now, if you're just tuning in for the first time, our previous episodes Every episode focused on one of those letters. So the, the first episode, our very first episode ever, focused on the S. Absolutely. And then the, the second episode was the L, then the O, then the T. And then today our focus is headstrong. Mm. To, get, to get going, um, let's talk about cinematic references. And you, and you know that if you've been tuning in before, there's a lot of <laughs> movie quotes that the, the sloth investor likes to make. Um, but I know that you've got one today that you want to zero in on and share with the audience. What is that? Mm, absolutely, Jay. You know, we started off so well all those weeks ago thinking about heat, Titanic, Superman, Nightmare on Elm Street. And I kind of feel like, Jay, we've dropped the ball. Where are the cinematic references gone? They've gone into the ether. I don't know. What, what's happened? So I thought this week we'd bring back a few cinematic references. And... Um, you know, one of the perks of being a sloth investor is that I can spend time on hobbies and leisure pursuits that I enjoy. Rather than spending my time tinkering around my investment portfolio or fretting about the performance of the stock market on a daily basis. So, um, yeah, I love going to cinema and I really love the movies of Quentin Tarantino. Jay, are you a Tarantino fan? I am actually a big fan and I'll, I'll never forget... Um my very first Quentin Tarantino film. We'll, we'll, we'll come a little bit, we'll touch on a little bit that, uh, a little bit about that later. Yeah. But I, absolutely, I remember just walking out of the theater thinking, wow, that's a great way, such a different way to tell a story. Ah, big fan of Tarantino, big fan. And you know, it's around about two years ago when the Sloth Investor, the idea for the Sloth Investor started to percolate around in my mind. Around about that time, that's when... A fantastic Tarantino movie was released uh, once upon a time in Hollywood. Have you seen that movie, Jay? I did. I oh. did see that. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, within that movie, we have a whole great cast of actors. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Margot Robbie, Brad Pitt. And for the purpose of this podcast episode, it's Pitt's character that I really want to dive into a bit more. So Pitt's character, Brad Pitt's character, he played a stunt double named Cliff Booth. Okay. And... Cliff Booth being a stunt double kind of got me thinking about investors because, hmm, for me, undoubtedly, the most notable occasion when investors require stunt double is during the periodic bouts of volatility that, for me, are a natural feature of the stock market. 
Okay, so I believe that investors, some investors, it's almost as if they require stunt double because sadly too many investors let their emotions get the better of them during these turbulent periods in the market cycle by taking foolish, foolish actions such as perhaps selling shares or perhaps even terminating their investing career altogether. Okay, so if you're listing right now, and you've got a pen and paper nearby, I would double underline what I'm about to say. Okay, write it down on a notepad. For me, this is really, really important. Okay, so your ability to effectively manage your emotions during periods of market instability will determine your success as an investor. Okay, so with this episode, we've reached our last bedrock principle of the Sloth Investor, the ability to be headstrong. Okay, so while this isn't a case of leaving the best to last, it certainly is, in my opinion, a case of leaving the most important to last, okay? Because this is because the individual investor doesn't need to look far to encounter what is likely to be the biggest obstacle to their success as an investor. Yes, quite simply, listeners, take a look in the mirror and you'll find it. All right, so you can put such principles as low fees, owning the world, and a long time horizon to decide for now, because unless you're able to control yourself to obtain mastery over your emotions, the performance of your portfolio will simply wither into insignificance, okay? So that ability to control yourself is so critical, Jay. And you know what, And if I can give the audience sort of a, uh, the, the perfect example, uh, I'm an owner of uh, the, the company Samsonite here in Hong Kong on the Hong Kong uh, Stock Exchange. And uh, a friend had put me on to it, uh, and we had been tipped off to it by Montley Fool Hong Kong when they were up and running before they um, packed up and left town. And we had been in the position where our money had doubled since our investment. We were very, very fortunate. And he said, I'm out, and he um, sold all the shares. And I, had, I remember texting him that day, like, oh, have you heard some information, or do you have a, um, a little tidbit that perhaps you want to share with me as to why you're out? And he didn't get back to me, and I just left my... my my stocks as is. And then they dipped down to about uh, uh, a gain of about 55%, mm. 60% in the next uh, month or so. Mm. And I started to get nervous and I started to um, become quite a bit afraid that, you know, how far is this going to go? Should I have locked in my gains and at least sort of just held on to the, the, the funny money that I would, would be left over. Um, but much to exactly what you're describing, I believe in the company. I, I believe in the the situation surrounding the company. And I'm glad to say, and I'm proud to say that I've remained headstrong and that I didn't sell. And now I'm back up to where we were when he mentioned to me that he was out. And I'm hoping that this will just this run will just continue. Fantastic. I mean, that's just such a great point because it can be tempting to look in our gains and think, wow, you know, my stock is up 100% or 200%. Okay, things are going really well. And let me capitalize on this and look in the gains. But, it, you know, it could well be that, like you say, the fundamentals of, of a particular company are so great, are so strong, things looking so positive, that it's probably the best thing to do is to continue to hold that company, to remain steadfast, to remain headstrong, and to lock in further gains okay it's a mistake that many investors make to kind of sell too early to look in those gains but again one of the best things we can do is to remain inactive and let the beautiful process of compounding take shape it's really important learn from my mistakes people mm. i sold i i had locked in some um very healthy gains from apple google and facebook over the last several years um and much to my chagrin the 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 stocks which i fundamentally believe in um, and I had believed in at the price point in which I had bought them, I'd tried to lock in some of the gains and sell. And much to my chagrin that the companies have just continued to flourish and the price has continued to um, climb and climb and climb. And obviously I'm missing out on those those gains. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's just something that um, we feel that we want to take action, don't we? I mean, something I'll talk about a little bit later in terms of action bias, but we, we do as investors feel compelled to do something, okay? Don't just it, don't just kind of stand and do nothing. Oh, I should be doing something, okay? So we think about what we achieve in life, whether it's learning to play the piano, whether it is mastering a new skill, losing weight. Taking action is often the best thing to do. And that's what's so fascinating about the realm of investing in that 
in most situations, actually not taking action, being inactive will often be the best thing, certainly for your portfolio. So yeah, it's fascinating that uh, that notion of inactivity, it really, really it never ceases to amaze me. And you know, before my next question, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that for a second really quick. Um, for a, a noob investor like myself, t- you said taking inaction. Mm. One of the things for me, um, it feels like, I might get several great stock tips a week and I don't doubt these companies. And there is a, you have to resist that urge to say, where can I bilk this money from to invest in this company? Because this company is going to do really, really well. And I've had to come to terms with the fact that I can't invest in every single company that seems like a great buy at that time. I'm going to just have to um, invest what I'm comfortable investing um, with the amount that I'm putting forth and uh, come to terms with the fact that I can't invest in every great tip that comes my way. So it's a really good point yeah. by you. I really, I really like that point, Jay. I like the lens that you're applying there to inactivity as well because, yeah, there will inevitably, with the democratization of information, you've got friends at the water cool, you've got Motley Fool, you've got Seeking Alpha. You know, week by week, you could just read about and hear about so many different great stocks that are IPOing um, and a stock that's unfamiliar to you, but it seems particularly interesting. But again, when we think about inactivity, it's important to recognize, well, you know what? I can't possibly invest in all of these companies, okay? And one thing I want to make really clear to our listeners is that when we've mentioned particular stocks in um, in previous episodes as well, to you know go further. Don't just think that okay, hey, the Slope Invest and Jay have mentioned one particular company. For example, during the uh, Owning the World episode, that was episode three, we mentioned at least half a dozen of companies during that episode. It's really important to perhaps use what we say as a catalyst. By all means, if something piques your interest, go ahead. But do your due diligence, do your research, read the company's 10K, look at articles on Seeking Alpha. Dig into the company's website, the investor presentation, see what other investors think. So it's really critical to do that. Okay, so take what we say as one piece of the puzzle, but do do your due diligence, particularly if you're someone that's interested in researching individual companies, and just make sure that you're getting a fully well-rounded picture of a particular company. Yeah, remaining headstrong um, for me has just made sure that I remain focused on my goal and making sure that I don't over leverage myself, over commit myself either um, by trying to sell stocks too early or trying to find where can I get this last little couple of dimes to invest in a great investment. So that, that's yeah. part of Headstrong as well for yeah, me. Absolutely. For me. Uh, you mentioned before to me about the temperamental toddler uh, and you use this in reference to the stock market. Mm, absolutely, Jay. Absolutely. So Benjamin Graham. Not just for kids anymore. Ah, I know. Tell me about Jay. You know, we can apply this to the investing. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So you're a father. I'm a father. And no doubt we've got many fathers, many mothers listening to this podcast episode right now. Okay. And Benjamin Graham. Let me kick off with Benjamin Graham. Okay. He's one of those investing luminaries. I'd put Benjamin Graham up there on the Mount Rushmore of investing, along with several others. Warren Buffett. Uh, perhaps even the Garden Brothers from the Motley Fool. But Benjamin Graham, okay, many decades ago, he came up with this analogy for the stock market. He referred to the stock market as Mr. Market, okay, as this kind of irrational person who doesn't behave in a very clear, rational manner, can tend to become quite exuberant, can tend to behave in a you know, depressed, melancholy state. So Benjamin Graham it is fascinating in that respect. And that's a great analogy, Mr. Market. It's kind of like maybe almost schizophrenic character. For me, I would refer to the stock market as this kind of temperamental toddler. Okay, so I'm a father to two children, a boy and a girl. And as a parent, I've had one child go through the toddler stage. And right now, my second child is currently moving through the stage of their existence. Okay, so Jay, I'm sure you'll be able to testify that children's behavior during the toddler stage can, can be interesting, to say the least. Uh, and the, the term, the way it was described to me is doing, being a parent, being a dad is the 
hard, sorry, the best but hardest job you'll ever do. I wouldn't disagree with that. I think it's a great analogy, actually. I would definitely agree with that. Okay, so um, having witnessed countless toddlers in my role as a parent, I've been able to observe the emotional vulnerability that forms a natural part of a toddler's temperamental terrain. All right, so if we imagine the stock market as an investor, I think it can be useful to characterize it in terms of being a temperamental toddler. All right, so there are many parallels that can be drawn between the two. So in it, it's in a toddler's job description to overreact to things of relatively small significance. All right, so maybe a little bit of milk has been spilled. Maybe their perf, their, med, their favorite toy is not quite straight on the counter. Okay, you name it. We know that young children can overreact to kind of what seems to be the most, the smallest things, all right? So likewise, as an investor, you'll learn that the stock market can be subject to extreme mood swings in investor sentiment, particularly in the short term. Okay, so as you become a more experienced and seasoned investor, you will learn that factors such as job reports, oil price movements, and the like have relatively little significance to your portfolio in the long run, okay? So mention a few factors there, but we can think about inflation talk, the Fed, maybe a nuclear flare-up on the Korean Peninsula, pandemics, oil prices, all of these things can have such an effect on the stock market, particularly in the short term. But circling back to our focus last week, it really is ever so important to remain steadfast and headstrong, committed to what you mentioned, Jay, just a moment ago, your long-term goal of investing for you and your family's future well-being. It's really important to do that. And I want to touch on a cartoon I saw once um, in a presentation from Andrew Hellum. Mm. And in the presentation, um, he just put up a, a graphic of, of, of one man, a, a cartoon in a business suit and a cartoon drawing of a fortune teller with a crystal ball in front of them. Yeah. And the, the line underneath it read, one of these two dresses in an elaborate costume to make you think he can predict the future. The other one has a crystal ball. Yeah. And I thought this was so perfect because it applies so well to the stock market and, and, and the people who desire this desire for a crystal ball and to see into the future. Mm. Can, you, can you speak more a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's a really great point, point Jane. Thanks for bringing up that great Andrew Hallam reference. Um, he's someone that we frequently mention on the Slope Investor podcast. So uh, switch on the financial news on your television or read the financial media, and it won't take long until you're confronted with forecasts of the future movement of the stock market. So if you're not careful, a combination of slick media coverage and finance-related jargon could tempt you to begin to take seriously the forecasts that you hear and read about. Okay, but it's important to remember that even broken clocks are right twice a day. So yeah, maybe from time to time, there might be a forecast that is, that is correct. But invariably, it's the case that it's so incredibly difficult to make accurate forecasts of the stock market. What is going to happen? We don't know. I mean, no one has a crystal ball. No one has a crystal ball. Who knows when the stock market will begin to decline and, and begin, you know, move into debt to bear market territory? Who knows, again, when it will move upwards again into a bull market? We just don't know it, any particular part of a cycle, okay? So one thing that I think is, is important to do, one thing that I would look to do, for, if you're looking to teach anyone about the movement of the stock market, let's say I was talking to a group of people who are newbie investors. If they're all sitting there in a the room, I would hand them a piece of paper and that on that piece of paper would be written the names of all the people that have been able to accurately forecast when the stock market is about to decline and when it's about to rise again, okay? An interesting thing is that on this piece of paper, well, there'll be no names. It'll be blank. It'll be a blank piece of paper because quite frankly, if you can name me a person who's been perfect, who's been able to accurately predict when the stock market is going to rise at, on a particular date, and again, when it's going to fall, I'd love to hear from you because who is able to do it? Because essentially, what you'd need to do is to get things right twice. And I think I referred to this a few weeks ago when I was talking about um, the simple path to wealth, a great book. I, gosh, the name of the 
gentleman uh, eludes me now. The simple part, it's JL Collins has come back to me, JL Collins, but he quite rightly makes the point that when we're thinking about forecasts, you have to get things right twice. You need to forecast when the stock market is going to decline if you want to get your money out quickly, but then you'd have to again forecast when the stock market is going to move up, okay? So who can do that, okay? Who can actually do that? No one has a crystal ball. So for me, the best thing is to remain steadfast and headstrong and to be able to remember to navigate those periods of volatility that are an essential characteristic of the stock market and to really respect the fact that uncertainty is something that is a key feature of the stock market. That's so, the only certainty. Yeah, the only certainty is uncertainty. So for anybody who thinks that, oh man, you know, you know, things have been quite volatile in 2021, particularly that March to April period. Well, yeah, that's par for the course. Uncertainty is what you need to expect. Okay. It's really, really important. So Rather than allowing this volatility to deter you from investing, you must recognize that it's part of the territory of being an investor, okay? So it's cr so critical to remember that, okay? Critical to remember that the market behaves like a temperamental toddler, and it's critical to remember that none of us have a crystal ball. And as you're talking, I'm just thinking about sort of the, the, the analysts who say, oh, this year I know the hockey team that's going to win is the Edmonton Oilers. And he might have picked the Edmonton Oilers to win the cup, the Stanley Cup that year. And just because he has accurately predict, predicted the Oilers to win the Stanley Cup does not make him the be-all and end-all of who's going to win the next Stanley Cup and the next Stanley Cup and the next Stanley Cup. And Andrew Hellen references it in his book, actually. He talks about how the likelihood of successful investors who beat the market um, are v the likelihood of them repeating as beating the market, being able to beat the market is in the low single digits. The people mm. who are able to do that, the amount mm. of people who are able to do that. Yeah. That yeah. Th Andrew, or sorry, not Andrew Helen, but Warren Buffett uh, has a great quote. And he says that stock market forecasters exist to make fortune tellers look smart. Love that. Love that. Yeah, I've heard it a few times. It's a great quote, isn't it? It's a great quote. And I want to circle back to what you just said a moment ago about analysts as well, because... It's important to remember that the business model of financial news depends on viewer engagement, okay? So this engagement is triggered by appeals to our most basic emotions, all right? So i.e. the need to exert some degree of control about the future. So in Verobi, what happens is from time to time, we're here and let's talk about a future forecast for Facebook or Amazon or Apple, okay? And the mistake that many investors make is to really become scared, terrified by what they hear about a company or companies that they're invested in and they may sell too early okay so for example they might hear that company x is planning to reinvest many of their profits into expanding into other regions okay and this might then have an effect on future revenues maybe you know future profits for example okay and um, in the short term yeah this may well be the case and what happens then is some investors do then sell shares only to then see within, you know, within perhaps even a, sh a relatively short amount of time, the share price might again go up. So if you've done your due diligence on a company and if you're really committed and you really feel that this is a company that you should remain invested in for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, then it really is best to remain committed to that company, to remain headstrong and not to... Um, not to worry too much. And, you know, it's going to be far better for your mental health if you disregard the soundbite circus of the financial media and its future predictions of the stock market, okay, and particular companies, and instead conserve your mental bandwidth bandwidth for other aspects of your life, such as family, friends, your le leisure pursuits, and your employment, okay? And this is exactly what happened to me several years ago and I, I just refer referenced earlier in the... Uh earlier in the podcast. So avoid the mistakes that I've made, my friends. Sure. So perhaps to round out this episode, maybe you can talk a little bit about action bias. Yeah, thanks, Jay. So I know it's something that we briefly touched upon earlier, but action bias for me is really critical to understand. It's really important for investors to recognize how this can negatively influence our behavior as investing, as investors. Okay, so we've spoken about the importance of ignoring stock market forecasts, okay? And when we think about life in general, we think about when we're looking to solve problems, we take action, 
All right. So when we think about if there's a medical problem, we go and see a medical professional. If there's an issue with our motor vehicle, we go and see a mechanic. Okay. So invariably, we want to take action to solve problems. But let's think about the humble sloth. Let's think about that animal. The humble sloth is predominantly an inactive animal. The sloth doesn't take action. The sloth, Mr. Flash from Zootopia, what a great movie, another <laughs> cinematic reference. The humble sloth, okay, remains inactive, okay? And that's what we need to learn from this animal, okay? Yes, the bull and the bear to an extent can teach us about the stock market, but the purpose of the sloth investor is to teach you how to behave as an investor. And that's why I've chosen the sloth, okay? So it's really important to think about that. I love what Warren Buffett mentions as well about a bar of soap. Okay, he uses in this analogy when discussing the movement that we can make. Okay, so when we think about a bar of soap, the more and more we move that bar of soap around in our hands, the smaller and smaller it becomes. Okay, and I like what we can think about there in terms of investing. Okay, the more and more we tinker around and take action with our portfolio, the more likely it is that actually our portfolio could potentially shrink, okay, could begin to wither, okay, perhaps even die, who knows, okay, perhaps a bit extreme there. But again, that bar of soap analogy, I think is really useful, okay. And someone I've mentioned a few times on a podcast, in addition to Andrew Hallam, is J.L. Collins. And J.L. Collins has had a really, really monumental effect on my beliefs as an investor. And he's a key individual when it came to the formation of the Sloth Investor. And I'm actually going to read a quote now from his book, The Simple Path to Wealth. And this quote tells tells us how he behaved during Black Monday. Okay, so Black Monday was a key event within the realm of investing. It took place in 1987. And I guess it would have been hard for him to write about because he actually talks about how he didn't behave in a correct way and he actually took action. And it's a great lesson for us here. So it's quite a lengthy quote, but stick with me because it provides a really useful lesson. Okay, so here he is talking about Black Monday in 1987. Begin quote. <clears throat> it is hard to describe just what this was like. Not even a Great Depression had seen a day like this one, nor have we si since. Truly, it looked like the end of the financial world. As any educated investor does, I knew that the market was volatile. I knew that on its relentless march upwards, there could and would be sharp drops and bear markets. I knew that the best course was to hold firm and not panic. But this, this was a whole nother frame of reference. I held tight for three or four months. Stocks continued to drift ever lower. Finally, I lost my nerve and sold. I just wasn't tough enough. Then, of course, and as always, the market began its relentless climb. The market always goes up. My mistake of 87 taught me exactly how to weather all the future storms that came rolling in, including the Class 5 financial hurricane of 2008. It taught me to be tough end quote. And I think just that really just speaks to the theme of this podcast episode, to be headstrong, to accept that volatility, uncertainty, they are characteristic features, characteristic elements of the stock market. They're to be expected, okay? And to be a successful investor requires you to be headstrong, requires you to be inactive, and requires you to commit to a long term mindset. And you know, <laughs> I mentioned it in, in previous episodes about how this is exactly what I did in 2008. Had I just held on to my ETFs and didn't sell, um, I probably, I wouldn't have to be doing this podcast. <laughs> I would be doing it, but I wouldn't have to be uh, having a, a job on the side. If, you know, my own sort of uh, Hollywood quote, I mentioned we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, Quentin Tarantino. Mm. And um, perhaps maybe I'll close out with my own Hollywood quote. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, a quote from Pulp Fiction, my very first Quentin Tarantino movie. And it says, if my answers frighten you, then you should cease asking scary questions. And for me, what this means is almost stop going looking, digging for scary information on the companies of which you own because the, the sensationalism could potentially scare you away and entice you to sell when you should just be holding strong. Absolutely, Jay. And we spoke so much about that last week in terms of episode four. 
time. That was our fourth bedrock principle. And um, yeah, we, we, we can see how easy it is for the sensationalism, sensationalism of the media, CNBC, financial media, to cause us to begin to catastrophize and to think the whole world is caving in upon us. Okay. And Given that we're in Southeast Asia, okay, and we've both lived here for quite some time in this region of the world, I'm going to end with a quote here from Confucius, believe it or not. I'm going back a long way now, Jay. I'm going back a long way. What but movie was that? I, what <laughs> movie? Let, let me double check that Tarantino movie of Confucius. Let me check. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is the quote from Confucius, and I love it. Okay. It's a short quote, but begin quote. Here we go. Begin quote. He who conquers himself is the mightiest warrior. End quote. And I, I love that. Okay. So, it, again, conquering yourself thinking about the biggest enemy that you have your biggest obstacle to success is what confronts you when you look in the mirror okay that's critical okay jay we brought it back we brought back the movie references pulp fiction once upon a time on wall street once upon a time in hollywood right i like this jay we're back in business i think we're back on top form <laughs> <laughs> thanks for tuning in this week everybody i hope you enjoyed our podcast and remember if you want to um, follow the sloth investor he's easy to find on twitter at sloth underscore investor thanks a lot jay see you next week take care everybody <laughs> For more tips, follow the Sloth Investor on Twitter at Sloth underscore Investor.